everybody. Welcome to another episode of Friends Talking Nerdy, my favorite time of the week. It's recording time. This is Tim Jowsma, and joining me in on the other side of the country, it's the holiest of holies. It is the Reverend Tracy. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Tim. I, I love that I automatically still do the prayer hands or do something silly with my hands when, when you like introduce me that way, mm-hmm. because, you know, originally we were doing video to this, so I don't know why I realized I do that. Like it, it's kind of up there with any time anybody compliments my hair, my reaction is to like touch it as if I'm surprised that I have hair on my head. So yeah, <laughs> I, I just realized I, I, was, I was I was trained to be the holiest <laughs> of holies and put my hands in a prayer position. <laughs> oh my gosh, how are you doing, Tim? I am doing good. Uh, we got a couple more weeks of school wrapping up. Um, got getting through that. I sat through the Peter Jackson Beatles documentary "Get Back" on Disney Plus. So there was that. How about you? Well, I mean, I started a new job. So that's been really cool. Yeah. Yay me. I'm a productive member of society again in the new times. Uh, It's actually been really cool. It's very low key, which is going back into, you know, I said I would probably be mentioning things culturally that I learn about Maine because every time you move to another state or another significantly different town, sometimes even within a state, you're getting into a different culture. Mm -hmm. Um, So the New England culture, I'm kind of loving it. (laughs) Very, very relaxed, very okay with family situation. And this is just something that you know, the Mr. Reverend and I have noticed about our offices and just generally how people seem here. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's been really cool. Uh, It's a part-time job. So that's kind of nice. Very chill. I'm working right in the heart of downtown again. So it kind of reminds me in a way when I started working for downtown, like in Portland, Oregon, Right. you know, being right there off of Pioneer Courthouse Square. Now I'm off of, I think it's the Monuments something square. I'm still learning every Everything. Um, but that's like kind of it's not necessarily the equivalent of Portland's living room, but it's the closest that I would have to offer. Just right. imagine Portland, Maine being a much smaller version of Portland, Oregon. I, I've said before, I even think on the show that this place is like a, a big, small town. Mm-hmm. So a little bit of that. I had a little bit of a giggle realizing that there's like God, I didn't even count, but it's at least five Poke stops. So I could sit there with my Pokemon Go and it kept buzzing. And I was like, I can't do that. That's not professional. So I, I just made sure I turned it off, but like, it was no. funny. <laughs> well, I I'd had it on, you know, when I'm driving, I'll turn it on because pushing a button is not a big deal. It's not a big traffic distractor. I can manage pushing a button and it not make me rear end somebody <laughs> like when it's vibrating. So it's not even looking at a thing, right? For anybody out there, it's like, oh, the reverend's a terrible driver. Hold on. This is a thing in my hand that vibrates and I respond by pushing a button. There's no sight being taken off the road. So yes, that's something I do when it's crawling traffic or I'm on a bus or something like that. But uh, so it was still on and I had it in my pocket and I realized it was like vibrating while someone was talking to me. I was like, oh God, I need to turn that off. (laughs) (laughs) Somebody's going to wonder why I'm vibrating. So what's nice is that means I'm going to be in the downtown area more. So I'm hoping I can do a little bit more of that. Hey, cool stuff about like Maine that I'm learning Um, because there is a lot of history. So I'm sure there's a lot of historical plaques because the reason there would be so many poke stops is points of interest. So mm-hmm. that will be kind of fun, um, maybe to be able to bump off and do that after work sometimes. Because I know that's something I mentioned is historically nerding out about the area I live in because there's a lot here. Yeah, and I mean, I'm still discovering places in Portland here that you know, it, in my five plus years of being here that I haven't visited. Like uh, last night, I went to Movie Madness for the first time. And saw, um, I, I didn't realize they had some pretty awesome uh, uh, Hollywood memorabilia there. Like they have like a, like a, in a, in a signed frame, they have the original knife that was used in the, in the movie Psycho in the shower scene. They have the rosebud sled. They have uh, like the bust that was used in Pulp Fiction for Marvin after he was shot by uh, John Travolta's character, Vincent Vega. They have a whole bunch of movie memorabilia there apart from the movies that they rent too so getting out and about is definitely a good thing oh yes i'm excited about it like that's one thing 
that I was pretty stoked about getting back into an office is just getting out into the world again. Mm. Like I don't mind. And I actually would love a remote job. Don't get me wrong. I'm a big proponent of how remote work could kind of be that give and take of it could be seen as a benefit for the employee as well as the employer because you're saving electricity and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, of course, the person who can handle working from home can kind of have an interesting work life balance. Like a lot of people found that during the pound- pandemic. Blech, that was a weird word I was going to start to say. <laughs> so people found that during the pandemic, you know, they were able to do stuff like do the laundry in between like your quote unquote break times because you'd still get up and walk for like 15 minutes or so and then you still go and have a lunch. It's just you could do things at home. So some people found that that work life balance works better for them. Um, But yeah. Yeah, the professor uh, having to work from home, um, like when when she would have to go to go into work, she would usually, uh, you know, go to work at 10 a.m. and be there, be at the building till like six, seven o'clock at night. But she found that once she started working from home, her actual work duties didn't take long throughout the day. She had a lot more free time (laughs) uh, throughout the day. So exactly it's like the mr reverend you know the pandemic hit right as he was coming up on midterms his junior year and then his entire senior year was online but what was amazing was his grades went up because he was no longer having to pack it up and ruck it you know from class to class or going in you know meeting at one of the study halls everybody had pretty much now because they had no choice they were doing a lot more remote study groups and a lot more, you know, being able to focus. And he started implementing something called the Pomodoro timer Mm -hmm. um, just so he could focus and study and then kind of switch between tasks. And that worked insanely well for him. But the problem is it's just, you know, some people it's different, right? Like just because you improved on your productivity doesn't mean it's the best thing for you overall. Like I do think my partner the Mr. Reverend you know being around people Mm -hmm. is really good because I don't even think he would be shy to admit out of the two of us I am definitely like the social I don't normally say I have puppy dog energy but when it comes to meeting new people I'm very much like oh yeah Tim is big time nodding I am a puppy dog I I want people to know that I'm friendly and I'm approachable and and he's just laughing at me just (laughs) just in case anybody was curious Tim is just nodding and laughing at this entire thing but yeah so me working from home I do have kind of that personality where I'm going to find those those friendships and that social interaction but depending on your personality if you don't do that outside of work it could be an incredibly better thing for you to go into the office because mental health and mental wellness says you too we're social creatures mm-hmm. period like you know we know that uh, uh, isolation like con- solitary confinement is really cruel to our psyche because we need interaction we're, we're like dogs in a weird way in that sense like we need to be socialized mm-hmm. we we would literally go crazy like that's what happens to people in these confinement situations they found so yeah i very much believe it is very individualistic. I, I don't think it's that there's like, oh, well now every employee ever needs to work from home because now you're cutting out people who basically are great workers, but they just need the physical and social interaction. Yeah. And, and I, I, you know, hopefully we do get to a point to where some companies realize that this has benefited them somewhat in some ways in terms of the remote and, and, and allow more remote work options. But um, one thing folks have to kind of worry about right now with everything going on is a resurgence in coronavirus. Yeah, it's kind of funny. This naturally led into something we wanted to talk about today. Mm -hmm. I've even already at my new job. Granted, there's like not a lot of people at my office, which makes it even more perfect for this whole COVID sitch. Um, I've already heard kind of misinformation in a sense because of some of the statements from the Moderna CEO and, you know, some of the information on boosters and stuff. So we thought it would be a good idea for us here at Friends Talking Nerdy to give you guys the lowdown on what we understand on this topic because it is something that we do both of us try to follow so that we don't go insane. Um, you know, for me, I intellectualize a little bit 
it mm. soothes me. And I don't want to be an anxious mess being around people. So that is why I follow COVID and, and what to do. So I think uh, Tim would probably agree that that's part of the reason he follows it as well. But I will let Tim speak for himself on this one. Yeah, I mean, this pandemic, I know in, in a lot of ways has somewhat scared me um, in terms of, you know, just how unwilling people are to be bothered even minutely you know and you know and I, I I've definitely become a lot more cautious in terms of you know where I go out you know and you know like uh like the Rose City Comic Con was not a good experience but I also ended up having an anxiety attack just due to the sheer amount of uh people that were coming in so I definitely keep up with with the news and I know some of the new uh like the Omicron variant um uh it's kind of somewhat scary I still I still believe that you know similar to like influenza back in the day that you know we will get to a point to where we will get a handle on it you know like the flu you know um that we'll get a handle on it and get back to some level of normal but you know when you have politicians in this country that are actively fighting against that all for a political goal you know it's like you know just uh, the worst things that could possibly happen are happening right now right like i really hated hearing you know because i listened to public radio because I do try to take in they, they, they just seem calmer to me they use less manipulative tactics uh -huh. um, on some of the headlines and they talk very calmly so it is a way that I do prefer to take in information but I had heard something on the drive home actually today where they had essentially said they were talking about flying and how we're going to implement or it's looking like that we're going to implement this idea of requiring tests at least one day um, from foreign people like coming into the country. Mm. And the, it, there's a high interest. They poll Americans and there's a lot of traveling Americans who would fully support the test rule for domestic flights as well. But the unfortunate thing that I heard on the radio that still just like irks me when this happens is that essentially, you know, people feel like their hands are tied on implementing it because it is not, quote, a politically popular stance, end quote, which means while most Americans would support it, it would cause so much fire politically that they're not willing to stand for it, even though the CDC supports it it would cause such a political conflict they're not willing to stand. And it's like those things are the things that it kills me when we're picking politically popular ways of doing things over picking what resources and immunologists and professionals in the field on like how viruses and stuff spread yeah. are suggesting. I mean, granted, flights, I've looked up a lot. I, I traveled back and forth for... Um, the haunters uh, doing the haunted house and I'm going to be traveling again for Christmas to go back and see my stepkids mm -hmm. with you know my partner we're going to go the Mr. Reverend and I so I did love hearing that transmissions are super low on flights it turns out just by nature um, because of everybody facing forward and most people are okay with wearing a mask it was a zero issue on either of my flights the Mr. Reverend also flies a lot for work. So of course, when we put that together, we started researching how dangerous is flying. Should we be wearing a Dollar Tree poncho to burn at landing at each location? And like, no, that's not necessary. It turns unless out- flying, Unless you're flying Southwest. You know. Unless you're flying Southwest, I guess. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it has its own problems like for other reasons. If the airport has problems for other reasons, maybe wear a poncho. But for COVID, it turns out maybe not necessary. Um, so yeah, that was something that, you know, bugged me today. Uh, but hey, you know, other good news is I guess they have approved a pill um, that if you've come in contact with somebody and are early on and have milder symptoms, so if the symptoms aren't super aggressive, you can take it and I guess it helps out. Um, in other news with boosters and everything is even the breakthroughs on if you're vaccinated, it's still showing that you're way less likely to end up in the hospital at all, but definitely way less likely to be on a ventilator, which is the big thing to avoid, honestly, because that's the thing that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Like, not only are they filling up, but the problem is, is before they're filling up, they're running out of ventilators anyway. So I, with everything I understood of it, I decided to go ahead and get my booster. 
Um, I know, I guess some of the comments from the Moderna CEO made somebody kind of comment to me that, you know, the Moderna booster isn't going to be good against the new variant. And so in kind of looking and reaching out and finding other, you know, intel on this, Mm -hmm. I get where what he said was taken out of context. I don't have the quote in front of me, but essentially, yes, it is a little bit questionable on the efficacy of it, but that's going to happen anytime there's a variant. It was never intended to question whether or not you should get it. Um, There was a mention on working on kind of a new recipe for some of the variants. But the thing is, is that's so many months out that because having the booster is going to make you so much more like um, it's going to give your body more resources and more practice, so to say, with this virus, that even if you do get one of the other variants, it's better than not having the booster. It's like the flu shot. I mean, like how many times have you gotten the flu shot and still ended up getting sick? You know, but the point of the flu shot is to make it to where you don't have to suffer with what they suffered when influenza first became a thing. You know, it's like medicine is there. Some people have this weird thing like, you know, like like you're not supposed to take medicine or something like that. Or I I don't get this logic behind um, vaccines or or stuff like that because it, it is scientifically proven that a majority of the people that take it will be safe taking it, you know, and and just go ahead. Well, I just I just wanted to put it out there that some of that is historically speaking because of some of the religious stuff that came up early on when inoculations were first being introduced back in the time of smallpox. Uh It was a very big stance of the church that God picks who dies. So I think personally, a lot of it comes from that. And it's just something we have not gotten out of our culture in that sense. And plus, we also have that kind of weird imperfection thing. So the idea of anything being wrong with our body is bad. It goes a little bit into that avoidance as well. Yeah. And then you can also, you know, it, it compounds as well because of just how expensive medical treatment is. So when you do find out something is wrong with you, it becomes a whole other level of, oh, my God, how much money am I going to spend on this? So uh, we just kind of have a weird relationship with our health. And I think it's been complicated by a lot of things. And then, of course, that resistance to inoculations coming from a religious background, it doesn't really take too much to kind of follow that trail as to why that's kind of become a Republican stance as well, because that is very much a big chunk of their demographics. So, of course, that's something that they're going to stand on. So that, that it sucks because that's just where it's at. They're, the fact of the matter is, is the people who came here, you know, you know, Thanksgiving, that that holiday that just just passed the whole idea of the pilgrims coming here and everything like yeah. it's just so frustrating to know that one of the big drivers for leaving England was they wanted their politics more separated from the church. And it's still happening like in that sense, because once it gets in there, it's stuck. So I guess we are still with that curse. So just kind of funny, like, guess, guess that didn't pan out super well as they thought that they were when they got on the boats to head here. (laughs) Yeah, hopefully we do get to a day just like in that South Park episode where uh, Cartman traveled into the future to get the Nintendo Wii and then everybody were atheists, you know, (laughs) I doubt we will. I, I, you know, I, you know, religious ideas have lasted for all these years. They're not going to go away, but you know, there has to be a, you would think there would have to be a balance to where people should should feel the freedom to celebrate their religion without trying to force it on others you know but what do I know I guess (laughs) and then I also just think it could have a lot to do with just control issues in general because you look back at the 80s and how hard people fought seatbelts like that was a thing fought seatbelts at one point parents fought you shouldn't get to make me seatbelt my child (laughs) like isn't that ridiculous when we think about it now like it's insane to think about that now that people fought that that hard like given what we learned about it but yet no matter what data was out there it still took a lot of resistance so it's just kind of that weird history repeating itself you don't tell me what to do that's, tell me what to do <laughs> exactly <I'm American. laughs> whatever i do what i want yeah. Jesus, take the wheel if it's my time to go 
I guess I, but yeah, so ultimately, you know, and we all know how that went and we still have seatbelt laws because even though it was just presented as an option, granted it turned into making them required in vehicles. Like that was part of that was making sure that they were required. So somebody had them if they wanted them in their vehicle, mm-hmm. but you know, it, it's just kind of funny, the resistance to life-saving devices um, and there were others too. It's just seat belts is one of my, my favorite ones to think of is because it just seems so nuts now. It seems so common sense to buckle up. Yeah. And hopefully, hopefully 20 years from now, the kids today will be like those idiot adults. Why didn't they get vaccinated? And hopefully, hopefully people have learned some lessons from the stupidity of this age because, uh, you know, hopefully. Yeah, but they'll have their thing too. That was actually an interesting thing. My my adopted family that I was with in October, mm. I was talking to my my adopted dad about that. Like, oh yeah, well, I'm wrong about something. I cannot wait to figure out what it is though. Mm-hmm. Cause I think every generation, right? Like has something that it, it just seems like every single one, no matter what it is, you grow up and then at one point that's a really bad thing. Um, one good example that I could think of is like spanking, right? Like mm-hmm. that was totally normal for my parents to do. I, I believe you too. I don't oh. know if you were ever spanked. Yeah. But corporal punishment was super normal when we were kids. But now if you spanked your child in front of a grocery store, you would probably have police there, I would think. Like, it, it probably depends on where you're at, too. We go into the little culturally speaking thing and yes. subcultures that we have in America. But it's, like, not something you would see, like, to the level that, like, I saw a lot of kids getting spanked in public when I was a child. Oh. Now, basically none. I, I, I think I've mentioned this on the show before, but first grade for me. I'm probably the last generation that saw this happen, but we were all lined up, ready to come back in from recess. And then the principal walks out. He has a chair in his left hand. He has a paddle in his right hand. He goes to the fifth grade boy, sets the chair down, takes one kid off, puts him over his knee in front of the entire school and whack, whack, whack. We were all good at the end of the day there, but that happened. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I still remember like one of the times I got spanked, but it was kind of near um, the whole end of it thing. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of afraid to actually spank kids. So I was like, my takeaway was, oh my God, like that didn't even hurt. Like this was like not a big deal at all. Like I've been so worried about getting in trouble this whole time. I was like, my, my mother would like wail on my ass, but that teacher was just like basically patted me with this paddle. And I was like, oh shit, I should like, I, I didn't really think like I should act up more, but there was a microsecond of, that my brain was like, oh, so this was fine then. Like, this wasn't a big deal. This is not a deterrent. <laughs> You're like, I didn't need to use the safe word. Hey. <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, I still didn't want to do it again because I was very much people pleasing as a kid too. It, and that's just, you know, hey, side nerd about mental health. Um, that's fawning response is a trauma response. So I was already mortified that I broke the rules. Like mm-hmm. even when I did intentionally act out and do shit, I was still sad that I didn't please this teacher, even though I did the thing that wasn't pleasing. So that eventually turned into like, I just was super well behaved because of that reason but yeah. like the deterrent was not being spanked though like that was the whole point was spanking supposed to stop the kids it's like no nah, for me it was just something clicked where I just got really like I wanted to please all of my teachers and yeah. you know never wanted to make the principal look at me with that face if I'm disappointed in you so the spanking was like absolutely nothing <laughs> yeah my high school uh principal played in the NFL and yeah no like he was taller than me but like tw- twice as much as me if that makes sense just a really thick guy and like you know deep voice but the sweetest guy in the world but I would not want to mess with him exactly yeah but speaking of kids we are here to talk about Big Mouth season five I was so excited to see this come out. It's that time of year. A bunch of things came out. F is for family. Um, There's even like some new Lost in Space. So we're getting into that season. You know, it's colder. So I'm super grateful. Um, It's also much like in Oregon. It's really dark here. So any of you guys that don't live in a place where it gets dark at four o'clock in the afternoon this time of year, 
those of us up north, we tend to like to hunker in and binge some stuff. So this actually was something that Mr. Reverend and I binged already. So I went all the way through Big Mouth. It's such a good season. I'm excited to talk about it. Uh, yeah, I've not watched all of the episodes yet. I've gotten three in so far. Um, I know the professor has watched them all uh, already. She um, usually just has that on the TV in the bedroom while she's falling asleep and it just plays on loops. <laughs> oh, see, I have shows like that too that I do that with. So I totally understand that. <laughs> yeah, so um, like we did with season four, we do kind of want to uh, dig into the episodes, but we do want to handle it a little differently this time. Um, you know, what we wanted to accomplish was kind of focus more on the themes and kind of talk about, you know, how we've sort of experienced that or dealt with that or just talk about those issues in general. And then we will go into uh, what we thought about the episode itself and then uh, give you our score. But uh, yeah, is there anything else you wanted to say before we dive in? Oh, no, I'm ready to do this. Let's talk about No Nut November. <laughs> yes, episode one of season five, No Nut November. Now, one of the themes, um, as the title implies, uh, is about masturbation. And I don't know about you, but I know the area I was at was uh, sort of religious as well. And um, I know uh, growing up, uh, up until 10th grade, for the most part, I was in private Christian, uh, in a private Christian school. So like, you didn't really hear anything about it. And then it, would, it was one of those, like, it was a big shock. I know in the 90s when uh, Clinton's first, um, uh, who was that? Um, the medical, the Surgeon General, Joslyn Elders, she came out and, you know, said that, you know, kids should masturbate. And that was a big, big problem back in the day. And she ended up uh, losing her job because of that, even though that, you know, it, with proper sex education and that, that may, you know, kind of alleviate some problems out there. But what do you think? Well, I also am from religious South in Texas, and then I did go to a Christian university. Um, and that's really funny because masturbation came up in one of the classes that I was in. I was studying psychology with an emphasis in marriage and family therapy, because I was initially going to try to be a marriage and family therapist and maybe work with kids too. Uh -huh. um, so there was this one teacher and he is still one that I look back fondly on. I, I don't have a lot of that with that school, but he was one of, he, he was a family therapist. Right. So he taught the more family therapy related psychology courses. And one class, it was a little bit more themed of talking to married couples where we had to talk about more sexual stuff. And of course, whenever you're dealing with a bunch of Christians that have been shamed away from speaking about sex, like pretty much their entire life, it's kind of hard to get people to open up. Yeah. And I actually remember there was a point in class where he asked if masturbation was a sin. And I have kind of had the personal opinion that it's not. Um, so before anybody skewers me, I will go ahead and try to explain my rationale just in case we have any Christians out there. Mm -hmm. Um, essentially I just kind of came out on it as that I don't view it as any different than massaging your neck. Um, it just kind of depends on the intent in your heart, which is more of the message in the Bible being somebody who was raised a little bit in the church and then like went to a Christian university where I literally had to take a Bible class every term it doesn't really say anything about the act of masturbation. It talks about lust. Uh, the only time I'm aware of that it does is in the Old Testament. I, again, I don't know the specifics here, so I don't know a name or the book in the Bible that it's in. But like, like there was a guy whose brother died. And like by law, he was supposed to take on his brother's wife so that, you know, th there can be an heir or something like that. But instead of doing that, he ended up masturbating and then he ended up being killed. But um, th that was not necessarily saying masturbation was bad. It was stating that this guy didn't follow the Jewish laws as they were supposed to be in terms of taking his brother as his wife and all that stuff. So it's exactly. like people, people take one thing and then twist its meaning to try and mean something else when it doesn't really mean that. And I do remember this because it was in the book, um, everything you always want to know about sex, but we're afraid to ask as a kid, I somehow got an old copy of that. And I remember that story. So. Yeah. And then there was another story and I don't even remember where it was, but it was, 
is about someone who <laughs> essentially it talks about that he pulled out, I guess. Like it's it's, it's the one where spilling your seat on the ground. That, that's right. The story. That's the story. Okay. Yeah, that is the same story. Got it. And it's like they didn't that wasn't to say that it was a sin in general you're right it was about a specific situation and it's also realizing in those times like babies died a lot so usually women had children so that they had surviving children so it was kind of really important to keep having kids so it was kind of saying in that sense of like yeah you should totally choose to impregnate like over spilling it out on the ground so it, it was never meant to condemn it totally but yeah. these were some of the conversations we got to have with this really cool teacher is talking about the time that it was written and how that very much matters because the bible was something written by man so mm -hmm. side nerd out about some of the religious shame that we've put behind masturbation and then it just goes back into our culture kind of glammed on that right like we still have a lot of shame sexually even non-religious families have a lot of shame about talking about sex and sexuality. Um, so yeah, and granted, like, it's funny, I said that, but it wasn't like I was masturbating constantly either. Like I still had a decent amount of shame about it, but I didn't yeah. think it was a sin to do it. So I didn't not do it because I thought it was a sin. I didn't not, wait, I was, oh, that was a wholly double negative. <laughs> <laughs> so basically I didn't not masturbate because I thought it was a sin and God would be mad. Yeah. I chose not to because I had other feelings of shame around it that were not related to religion. I chose not to because I didn't know what would happen at the finish line, if that makes sense. So like I would try it as a kid, nothing would happen and be like, what's the deal with this? Like, I don't get why adults are so wrapped up into it and then didn't do it until like 19. It's just like, fuck, you know? <laughs> because I didn't know how and I'm, I'm not sure I'm saying that we should be like explaining to kids how to masturbate I guess that's one of the the things going around because that's another thing too is like every now and then right mm -hmm. um someone will uh like there'll be a new wives tale or whatever right yeah so uh, I, I I had heard that supposedly some teachers were like assigning homework on masturbation. I haven't seen any actual examples. So I, I'm actually prefacing that I don't think this is true. Yeah. But um, I'm not saying we should teach kids how to masturbate. I think they would honestly just figure out if we just didn't have a sense of shame around discovering our bodies. Like, I don't yeah. think you need to spell that out. But yeah, like I didn't know how. Uh, it was a naughty phone call with an ex-boyfriend that he basically told me how. <laughs> and that was... I was like, oh, and that didn't happen until way late. So, and then it's funny because you talk about like not knowing the end. And speaking of Big Mouth, it takes us back to the beginning of Nick Birch, right? Like he had that awkwardness around it. Like he didn't know what to do or it was like it would hurt and his hormone monster like was kind of confused about it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so that didn't help. So I do like that theme. I think they did cover like the conflict on some of the masturbation stuff pretty well. And I think, too, uh, what I liked about th that theme in the episode, too, is I think they did show the, kind of the futility of these things like No Nut November, because I believe that is an actual thing, you know. Yeah. And, and I even like like Missy's throw. I was like, mm, I think this is putting some unnecessary shame around masturbation. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I don't know how much I could celebrate like uh, uh, either extreme of it. Right. Like a month where you're supposed to like what was it decimate your dick December was the joke early on in this one yeah. as we talk about the episode like I, I think either month is kind of unhealthy but that goes to where that is big Buddhism in me as I try to go to the middle path in most topics so I'm not sure I would ever personally try to do that and I've never tried to do either by the way like oh god I would like it would I, like if I if I said I was going to participate in something like that, I like people's response to me would be the same as what Andrew received. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, of course you are. Um, anyway. <laughs> but basically, I, that it was, and we'll get into that because Andrew and, and his stuff. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, now, now with kids, though, like, like to your point, I, I, I think 
when it comes to stuff like masturbation, I think kids should be made aware of it. But I agree that it's also, yeah, I don't think I need to, prov- I don't think a parent should be the one to provide their kids an instruction on how to let them figure it out because that's their body. <laughs> right. Like there's stories of parents and, and this is maybe because I'm on, you know, some blogs and some groups and stuff I've mentioned before because, <laughs> you know, uh, collective knowledge, I'm a big collective knowledge human. So I love being part of support groups, like dealing with family and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And there's still like kids start exploring those areas really young. Like there's this whole thing with developmental psychology and you'll even hear parents still freaking out about like, Oh my God, my little boy, like touched his penis or my little girl like tried to do this and I'm like there's okay like unless they're doing something like really aggressive where they're hurting the area like maybe freak out a little less about that like it just seems like there's some natural things and natural like stages that they would be doing some self-discovery oh, yeah. but that there's still this shame around it so and it's interesting because it goes back to this was written to relate to us who are older but there's still this big topic around shame and like how much we should talk about sex to our kids yeah and and I think yeah a lot of the problem does fall on parents too because yeah like if they do see like a lot of like I'm I'm assuming the kids that you're talking about that that are doing that are probably on the younger side and probably just oh no just touching exploring or something like that and on the one hand as a parent myself I can get like you see something like that, it's like, you like that, but that's where you also take the time to respect your kid, to have a conversation with them about why you reacted like that, why, why it wasn't right, but, and, and talk to them that, you know, just talk, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It's, and it's more just like the, you know, you don't do that in public. <laughs> you know? yeah. I think there are valid conversations to have when your kid's discovering themselves, but there's like a lot of very well-written books, like from people who've studied child psychology um, on how to cover those topics, which is funny because I do recall like speaking of that there's still just so much twist about this is there was a library book that was released and I forget what state it was, but yeah, there were people trying to get this library like into a lot of trouble because it had this book and the library stands like, well, you're the parents. So maybe just don't check out that book for your kid. Don't know what to tell you. But there's <laughs> like, it's child pornography. It's like, it's educational. Um, it's not in any detail. It's like, you know, cartoony stuff. So, but that's how bent we are about it. Right. Um, uh, so it's just interesting that that's still just this issue that we haven't quite finished unpacking, you know, as generations continue. Yeah. I mean, and I, I do see a lot of positives, you know, in terms of how things are today compared to, you know, how they were in the eighties when I was a kid in the nineties and my twenties. And, you know, when you were a kid, I mean, there have definitely been a lot of positives, but we are nowhere near the place to where, you know, other countries are, for instance, when it comes to like, you know, collective, you know, sexual knowledge as, you know, sex ed- education and all that stuff. I mean, th- this country is a long way behind. Oh, yeah. And that goes into where it's like we have this interesting parallel, like with sometimes our government or educational system and our people of like this no flaw mentality, like there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing ever wrong with me. So and I think that's really what we're battling. We're not willing to look at what works for other countries because we very much have it to a point where it permeates even to our individuals of like there was nothing ever wrong with what I did. You know, it's like trying to talk to your parent about maybe spanking being bad. You know, it goes back to that draw in of like, you know, I'm going to find out what I'm doing wrong today later, just like my parents found out spanking me was wrong, but they won't talk about that ever having been wrong, because there really is a part of us that really wants to deny being wrong, but you really rob yourself of a lot of growth with that mentality. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, like the American exceptionalism, if you want to take it back into politics, again, this idea that America has done nothing wrong over the years, that every decision this country has ever made has been great, blah, 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 which is simply not true. And, you know, you know, that phrase, you know, history will repeat itself if you don't learn about it, blah, blah, blah. You know, it, 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 it is true. If you don't take the time to reflect on your actions of the past, you're not going to grow and be a good person. Yep. And then applied to the individual, that's Carl Jung right there. That's shadow integration theory. Like that's like, hey, something went bad in a friendship. 
I should maybe sit down and figure out where I contributed to that. And I honestly think, you know, we've mentioned a few times that you and I had a very significant falling out at one point. Mm -hmm. And I think if it weren't for the fact that each of us did that on our own, I don't think we ever would have been friends again. And now you're like one of my best friends. So I'll take that. There's a lot of growth that happens between people. So it's like, I just imagine it kills me how much we could grow as a culture if we were just down with question, like down to question, like how we teach certain things. So masturbation was one of the big themes. And really that's going to continue for a few episodes, I think. Like well, that it seems to happen on every episode with big mouth. <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm glad you brought up what you did at the end because that is a good segue into the next theme of the episode. And that's dealing with like the after effects of like a breakup and how social media can affect that. Um, because oh, yes. it, 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 you know, depending on the intensity of a split, you know, social media can very much be a very bad thing. Oh, yes. Like I... Oh, man, like I, I don't block people usually. I mean, I know I did at some point yeah. with you, but we've already unpacked and talked about that as individuals. But yeah, I've learned in interacting with people that they take how you treat them on social media extremely seriously. And it's a disconnect for me, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if you had told me at one point, hey, T, I needed to put you on restricted because I just needed to not be have you in my feed and you know I wanted to be able to post things and not worry about you thinking it's about you for a minute because you know restricted just basically means I would have only seen like your public facing posts mm -hmm. but I have no problem with that like I understand you're trying to relationship manage based on your needs meanwhile what I just explained to you was pretty much verbatim what I did with another now we are totally not friends I do not see this one um reconciling at any point right but i had told this person like hey i didn't know what was wrong you were refusing to speak to me so i had put you on restricted and this person like completely lost it on me Whoa. and like called me a narcissist well didn't call me one just very strongly implied that i was one you know and uh like it was a really interesting blow up effect that i didn't understand so yeah, like I use it. I think it's very smart to manage what goes through your social media. And that's even something I talk about um, from time to time on my page where I talk about mental wellness and mental hygiene. I think it is a good hygiene practice to be aware of what's on your feed because that's the feed that's going to your brain. So yeah, if you've got somebody that's posting a lot of political shit, like put them on restricted or like unfollow them on your feed for a minute. Just I've learned maybe don't tell the person about that. <laughs> yeah, they don't need to know that. I mean, because, yeah, I mean, it, it, there are people on my feed, not you, but there are people that I've, you know, put, like my aunt, for instance, she, um, she doesn't post much, but she is also a hardcore conservative member of Right to Life and all that stuff. And like the past four years, I don't want to know her opinions on stuff love her she's my aunt but you know i don't need to know her opinion um and and like social media is definitely a minefield in a lot of ways there can be some great positives you know because of technology because of social media i've been able to be friends with um you know people around the country um that i wouldn't have been friends with you know at, at least not as close as i am without having you know this technology at my hands to be able to connect with them you know but uh, on the flip side too yeah like if you do get into an argument with somebody you know seeing them on social media can be triggering um you know and and also too like if you are in the an emotional state and you see that person it can definitely get the wheels going in negative ways too so it's, exactly it, yeah like i i know like um you know like uh, when we did have our blow up, it made, it did kind of show me how I was using social media in an irresponsible way. And like, since that time, I've, you know, limited who I have on my social media and also what I say on it. And, you know, I, I people do need to be a lot more cognizant of it because also to as shown in the episode, it can be used negative. I mean, look what Lola did. Oh yeah. Like she was blatantly and intentionally, like posting stuff for Jay. But what was funny was she actually said it was for him. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, you also have the flip side of that where, you know, someone will go and stalk on your page or whatever publicly and they'll be reading into stuff. And by the way, this is just a little reverent PSA. If somebody has not mentioned your name specifically, understand the world does not revolve around you. And so statistically speaking, it's not actually likely they're talking about you. Yeah. Um, and I only say that because, you know, I make shareables, I make things and I do share things. And a lot of times it's because my heart feels for other people in different groups that I'm in. Mm-hmm. You know, there are, you know, step moms who deal with very intense situations and that's interesting to read in co I'm like, wow, yeah. And it goes over that overall topic that I try to keep going of like, hey, our cultural view on how we deal with relationships after a breakup, like, seems really shitty and like destructive and inhumanizing. Like, it, I, I just wish we would look at it. So, you know, but I could see, you know, if somebody's stalking my page and if it's something about an ex that they might think it's about them. But it's probably not like a lot of people just share things to share them for me. And I I did so like have talked about this on here, too. Like, absolutely. Managing your social media is very much a mental hygiene step you can take. Um, And that goes into I've talked openly about I don't follow certain news people anymore, because when you start doing signs of manipulative headlines, where I'm reading a headline and it's not stating a fact, they're using things to make me upset. I don't follow that. So the flip side is if I've got a friend who is doing the same thing, I don't care if it's quote unquote, the side that I like, I'm still going to maybe not follow that friend or take a break from them for a little bit, because those are the messages I've already said. I don't want, I don't want that in my feed where I'm being manipulated that is my choice. I'm not saying my friend is manipulating me. It's just, unfortunately, they're sharing things that do that. And it's not my job to correct them and start a fight on their wall. So for me, it's easier. Yeah, it's just, it's not, it's not your job to police the world. Yeah. And and like one thing I've learned too, is like, I I can imagine this would would apply for folks in school. Um, The mistake of adding all your coworkers or schoolmates onto your social media feed as well. Um, Because like when it comes to like workmates, for instance, you know, good people, you're going to work with a lot of good people and you're going to have a lot of work buddies, but not a lot of those people will necessarily be an actual friend you know and like you're in you're like mixing up in in like mixing up like a work situation with a personal situation or a school situation with a personal situation and Mm -hmm. then like the more you like dive into the into like work or school or whatever the more it like uh, yeah just people tangle themselves too much and too much social drama and i've been very guilty of it in the past oh Um, yeah me too like let me own that one speaking of shadow integration um (laughs) Like, yeah, I was horrible about that shit. Um, There's that little bit of, you know, you feel self-conscious and there's that paranoia and you do think things are about you sometimes. And to me, it's just healthier to not focus on that. Um, So yeah, if there's people out there that I had no reason to block them other than I don't want to go look at their page because I don't want to be the one triggering myself reading into things that don't say, this is absolutely about you. Yeah, which kind of leads us into the last big theme of the episode here, and that is obsession. Yeah. And and it's like especially tough when you're younger, of course, and, you know, like like with also when you when you're introverted have anxiety as well you know sometimes that can lead you know and I've been guilty of it where you're obsessed you know like oh my god she loves me and and, or or obsess on the negative side of this person hates me and like everything they say is about and, and like obsession it it's like I think that's something too that I, I don't recall having too many conversations with my kids, sadly, uh, about that and the general idea of it. And it's just like, you know, uh, how are they going to walk through that minefield of either not getting into habits that lead them to be the obsessive type or to have to deal with someone who is an obsessive type? What do you think? Oh, gosh, I do think it's a topic we should totally cover with kids because it goes back to it's not seeming to be something that we grow out of. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think a misstep that 
a lot of parents make, and I'm going to say that very carefully because I know I have not birthed children, but I have worked with a lot of them. And I think, and this even goes back to, I was a kid once, right? Like I was a child. I remember parents trying to get certain messages to me and why they didn't sink and maybe tried to unpack those later in life. And I think the problem is, is we teach obsession is don't do that. Meanwhile, it almost seems healthier in, in a way they're more receptive if you teach a being curious about your feelings in general rather than act like trying to teach them things are bad. Does that make sense? Like instead of saying this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad, like teaching kids to have a curious relationship with their feelings rather than some weird sorting system that you're supposed to teach them to memorize in a sense, because if you think about it, we're just, we're humans. Mm -hmm. We just have decades more of experience on them. So it's not something that I think is so black and white with feelings. Like I, I think the big misstep is trying to teach is if there is a chart of right and wrong rather than just investigating. So if you are feeling obsessive type feelings, maybe question them instead of quote, just resisting them because that's bad. <laughs> yeah, because like, as we'll get into in later episodes with like the love book, for instance, you know, when you fall in love, that is a bit of an obsession at that point. And is that necessarily a bad thing? Not really. You know, no, but it, it goes it? back to healthy levels, teaching mm -hmm. healthy levels. And that's also why it's like, I'm not sure I'm down with teaching, like obsessing over something is bad is being the lesson. Yeah. I, I much rather just with kids focus on like, oh, you have a insert strong feeling. You should maybe question that within yourself. And hey, I'm an adult. And if you'd like to have like a talk about it, I can offer some guidance. I could offer some situations where I could relate as best as I can. But it's it's the prescriptive pressure that parents have, like that there's supposed to be an answer for everything when really it's more about guiding them. Yeah. Um, but yes, the obsession that happens. And like you mentioned with the love bugs later, we'll get into that in a few episodes, how that continues. And even through the season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, I think the big thing, I mean, especially, you know, parents with boys, you know, have to be, I, I think the big thing too is like that, you know, is talking to them about the importance of communication, you know, obsession, like I said, especially if it's something, if you're, if it's about someone you're falling in love with, isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it does become a bad thing. Like if you never talk to that person and if you're stalking their social media or, or doing, or, you know, like writing like love notes to them and, and never just talking about communication more than anything, I think would be a, a, a big step in terms of not having obsession be as big of a thing as, as you know, it can be. Cause I, I know my, you know, uh, like my mother never talked to me about it and, you know, I, you know, I've been, like I said, I, it's, it's, everybody's been guilty of it in, in some way, shape or form. And there have been times where I've been obsessed and stuff and, um, but yeah, talk to your kids. Yeah. <laughs> to Adults get obsessed too. Let's not pretend like it goes back to what I mentioned a little bit ago is this is oh. not something kids grow out of. What's weird is I've kind of felt like that was something that I was taught that I would grow out of. Um, but no, like that was something I very much needed to train my brain and that obsessiveness like manifests in a lot of ways. Think about a time that you almost had a car accident and you left it thinking that motherfucker caused this and that you're still fuming about it. Some might say obsessing about it like hours, sometimes days later. I've done that before and I realized how ridiculous that is. Like what a waste of fucking energy. I mean, granted, that situation is easy to call it a waste of energy because it was just traffic. But it goes back to like that obsession idea is not something we just grow out of. And it goes back to, yeah, big takeaway. I wish we would question strong emotions, like get a curious relationship instead of trying to teach a weird negative relationship with strong emotions. Yeah. Just trying to question some logic into it, you know, like, is this, does this person really feel this way or does, or mm -hmm. am I, you know, not being realistic, realistic, just, just question it. Be, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, and I think Andrew's parents are like the perfect example of like that whole teaching that no, that's bad. No, that's bad. No, that's bad. Like there's no explanation as to why it's bad. There's no talking about the topic to help it be understood. So I guess that's kind of, I just realized that was a good example of that type of parenting. So, and I would say that that could even imply that that's still very much in 
parent culture today then, because they do try to touch on topics that are still standing today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, speaking of the episode here, what do you think, what are, what is the one good thing that really stuck out to you for this episode? So I know we kind of naturally talked about, I would say, kind of some good things about it, just as we were Mm -hmm. talking about the themes. But as far as little standalone moments, I like that Missy is able to keep her hormone monster in check. Like, it's good to see someone doing it. Um, Nick has moments with that, too, where, you know, she will put Mona in her place sometimes. Um, And, you know, she said that bit about, you know, the unhealthy masturbation thing. Like, don't want to participate in something that kind of, like, perpetuates that kind of dishealth with it. Uh, And I really kind of dug the throwback to the squirmy worm because that was kind of her she crossed a line at some point with her relationship with masturbation where she was almost too comfortable with it right because she seemed to have that household that was very comfortable but it goes back to what we just talked about I'm not sure they ever had the don't do it in public talk right Mm -hmm. because she took squirmy to the sleepover in a prior season so I loved the throwback to that Um, And I think it just kind of shows that she is developing a very healthy relationship with masturbation, Um, even going into kind of questioning some of the morals around like what to do and what not to do and things like that. As we get into some of the stuff on, is it okay to fantasize about people, which I think it goes more into that in the next one, but it kind of starts getting into her relationship with masturbation and people like yeah. here. Um, so I really, I love Missy. I like her character. There's little parts about her character that grate me from time to time, but for the most part, I dig her. Um, I think out of it, her parents have it kind of down in a sense. I mean, they're not perfect either. And it's gone into those topics as well, but I think she's really well-rounded because of her parents, albeit not perfect. She's just better rounded than a lot of the other characters she's around. Yeah, she's by far the most realistic character. I think the other ones are either caricatures or in the case of Nick. I mean, Nick is just adult Nick as as child Nick. You know? I, Andrew, and we'll get into him in some of these yeah. comments. I, I felt a theme. I think I'm a little over his character, but we'll I'll pepper that in throughout. Because there's moments that I like him and he brings a good chuckle, but he seems to be so hyperbolic with his issues at this point that he's losing me. But yeah, we'll, we'll get into that with the, the yeah. bads of the episode later. <laughs> well, let me uh, tell you my good. And, and, and the good for me has to do with uh, the G and Lola uh, uh, situation because it was so heartbreaking. Because <laughs> like they were, it, it's like they were both so scarred by their past experiences that their defense mechan- mechanisms are making them blind to the fact that just like one word one something it could they could easily just really make up and then they just don't and that is just so sad but they do it so realistically it's it uh, that's that storyline in itself i I think is probably some of the best things that uh, big mouth has done you know because again it's taking two characters that on the surface are probably two of the most two-dimensional characters on the show but giving them both some real life right and i know i've already nagged a bit about how i wish they'd go into it a little bit more seriously the situation with these two kids because just on that realistic note when you look at who they are lola is in a neglect situation Like in real life, that's a call to CPS. And Jay is also in a very seemingly abusive home. So look at the stuff he says his family does. I mean, he is in an abusive home. Oh, yeah. It's just I don't think they've crossed the line to show some of the stuff that's implied. You know what I mean? So that's where I say seemingly because he talks about it. But so I I have no reason to disbelieve. But both of those situations seem abusive. At the very least, neglect as well on Jay is very prevalent. Mm. So I go back to I have a hard time with their story because 
I just kind of feel like you're making light of a situation if you're not actually talking about the the actual like weight of that of these yeah. two kids being in kind of shitty situations and it even manifesting in that way it goes back to the kind of trauma response of being so afraid of being hurt that you take any sign of them hurting you is like nope need to reject need to push away as far as we can we can't be together because this human hurt me so they're going to always hurt me Yep. Um, and that's really what you're seeing play out on this one, I feel. Uh, I don't know if these guys are being that intentionally deep, but that's just the psychological end of it that I'm seeing. But that goes into the show is more focused on the experiences that they understand as real. So, yeah, that's a very real thing that kids that are in abusive situations might be very hyper vigilant about their relationships to the tune of rejecting somebody over the slightest hurt. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I'm hoping by the end of the season, we do see a reconciliation. I, you know, who knows at this point, um, but uh, by the look in your face, probably. <laughs> <laughs> we will see. Yes. yes Cause I'm, I'm very far ahead as mentioned. I've seen the whole thing. So it, it'll be interesting to see how this one goes though. You'll, you'll, it's a roller coaster, of course, but I think that's kind of implied by them at this point anyway. Yeah. So I'm not even sure that counts as a spoiler for you. <laughs> okay. Now the bad of the episode, I know you've been uh, kind of waiting, waiting to say this. Okay. So I'm going to start with not the one that I've already hinted at. And that's just come Kumal. Like it just gave me a huge eye roll moment. It just, feels like a grossness grab which is just not my favorite style of comedy that being said not everybody's down with the dark humor that I love so much I love when the show is dark humor so I'm sure there's the counterparts to me out there that hate the dark humor but think the gross humor is just top ace of shit but I just felt like the cum uh, manifestation of this person was just gross yeah. and unnecessary also Andrew's masturbation obsession feels a bit too much for me at this point and like to the point of is this really that common in boys like uh, yeah, the to the point where the couch squeaking was making him like ruin his edging and putting him over the edge like i just kind of wonder at this point how someone has not actually intervened on this because this would be the sexuality of a child that would be alarming behavior I, not self-exploration and curiosity but when you literally can't get through a day with like couldn't get through dinner like he normally like every he talks about and his parents even seem aware because of him masturbating at ZD's funeral. Like it's been a thing where people seem aware of Andrew's a huge masturbator. But it just seems like it's to the point where someone should have intervened at this point. And it could even go to our parents educated enough to understand when the sexuality is overt like that. Well, at the end of the episode, they had him like going to like what a synagogue and masturbating there and then being thrown. No, it was an open house. It was an open house and then being dragged. It's like even at 12 or 13, I don't think they would just kick him out. They would call the cops at that point. And then like think about it like this. Like if you had a friend that came over and did to your couch what Andrew did to yours, would you invite him over? Or if you were a parent and your kid's friend did that on the couch, would you be inviting that kid over again? No. Especially with how educated those parents are. Like it's very implied that Nick's parents are highly educated. And so like they should be the ones to know that that's kind of alarming behavior. Yeah. Um, and that even goes to it's not to say that he's a sicko like his own father calls him, but there are legitimate hormonal reasons to intervene like on a medical level. Um, if it's really that rampant, it kind of is almost a throwback to how Nick had wanted testosterone pills, but the doctor was like, it's too early for that. But on the counterbalance, it's like, it really kind of seems like Andrew needs to have the other conversation with the doctor of, yeah. Hey, I think I've got too much of this producing. 
um, because that is a thing and that's a thing that can be treated. So it's just kind of interesting that my takeaway from this is like, I feel like this child is going through like something interesting like that that could really use some medical intervention, mm -hmm. much like how sometimes girls are put on the pill because of like estrogen levels and things like that can be kind of like screwy sometimes. And I'm it's something that. that can be helped with. Yeah. So on the counter is like, yes, this is something that can be helped with, but it could go with the stereotype of boys are just so sexual. So it goes back to, I wonder if this is just a lack of education for the parents. The thing that's the disconnect is to me, Nick's parents should have been able to know, but they also have turned a blind eye to Jay's situation. Yeah. I, I mean, they remind me a lot of like the limousine liberal types, you know, the ones that say the nice things on social media, but at the end of the day, if you interrupt their lifestyle, they're, you know. Yeah, but, like it's not exactly my problem person. Like yeah. it's bad, but it's not my problem. Yeah. <laughs> my son, my son's good, you know. Mm. Um, for me, for the episode, uh, the Missy storyline, I just didn't, it didn't seem realistic to me. And I think the big sticking point for me is this the show is supposedly set in modern times yet missy a 12 13 year old girl is having fantasies about nathan fillion if this were 10 years ago when firefly was just fresh off the air or something i, I could possibly see that but right now nathan fillion is not doing any i mean he's he's working of course but he's not doing anything that is really geared towards an audience that i would expect missy to be a part of so am i nitpicking this is very much a nitpick but you know it's just, it just it's it's odd it, it's just like i it, it, if it was a celebrity like a celebrity that was younger in age, closer to her age, maybe I could accept that more. But it's like, uh, even even in that episode, I think Nathan, Nathan Fillion himself said, uh, you can find me in LA. I'll talk to single mothers all the time. You would think Missy's mother would be more into Nathan Fillion than him. And it, it's like, I, and, and also too, I didn't get why she had a problem not fantasizing about, you know, Devon. Because it's like, she doesn't necessarily have to tell him why does she have to have a guilt complex over just having a fantasy I, I i didn't get that either you know so i saw your notes on this and i actually have a response for both of those things okay. so if you notice the poster on missy's wall and most of what she's referencing is firefly mm -hmm. So it goes back to her parents are really nerdy, particularly her dad. So it very well could be that he's watching a lot of Firefly. And in that sense, Nathan Fillion could be kind of locked in time for her. I remember being attracted to a lot of older men when I was a kid, but that was because like, oh, he's cute, right? Like I'm responding to somebody being marketed as being the cute, the heartthrob. Yeah. Kids respond to that too. So I just kind of noticed like a lot of the times, like she's not fantasizing over posters of castle which is kind of one of his more recent works that got out there i watched it for a little bit too because i still have a crush on nathan fillion <laughs> like yeah. uh, he is he is totally like older so i did kind of feel that a little bit like mm, but if she was watching a lot of it she might not have even known when she was developing this crush you know, as a youngster. So, you know, there's kind of the, she's never met him in person. So I think it would be weirder if she still maintained the crush meeting an old man. Does that uh, make I, sense? She I, may not really connect that he's that much older because it just depends on her experience to him. And, I, and maybe too, it doesn't help that, you know, Nathan Fillion actually voices the character and he's Nathan Fillion of today. Um, and, and maybe I am being too hard on it because, you know, I'm sure there are still some teenage boys that are that watch Return of the Jedi and still lust over Carrie Fisher in that metal bikini you know, and, you know, she, you know, she's now passed away, you know, <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. I mean, I had... I, I just remember having a lot of like adult crushes as a kid, like, but they were stars. So that was okay for yeah. some reason, which is just something that I am like, we should question that maybe a little bit, <laughs> like when kids do this. But I think like given the context of it, I would just assume that they've probably never watched a lot of his newer stuff because there is that kind of cult following around Firefly. So I think she's in one of those homes that <laughs> has that kind home, of yeah. <laughs> yeah and then also to speak to the 
the uh, fantasizing about somebody, the guilt around that. Now that does go back to that interesting point that we talked about earlier with masturbation and the religious shame around it is that is that point. So if you do believe in a, a concept of sin against somebody, that's where you're crossing that line to lust. So I think that, again, is something that comes stemming from a background of religion. But that actually has some ground in the religion because it goes back to the, the lust in your heart type passages. It says not to lust over your neighbor's you know, partner, things like that. So I do think that's another thing that stems back to just kind of that that Christian culture taking in. Um, Weren't Missy's parents, didn't they say that Missy's parents were like agnostic or atheist already? Yes. So yeah. isn't that interesting how much that can still bleed over? But that is very much some of the religious attitudes behind masturbation mm -hmm. that I feel like, because again, I'm not going to go into say this is a matter of factly why we are this way. It just seems to really be of high coincidence that we have these shameful feelings around things and they seem to be messages that have lingered from some of the Christian values of old that, that, that still seem to be permeated even into our agnostic and even atheist cultures. Yeah, I mean, like how many atheists still celebrate Christmas after all, right? So it's it's if if it's part of the culture, you may not necessarily believe it, but uh, you, but in a way, you kind of do, I guess, if that makes sense. Just because yeah. it's so ingrained into your life, you know, like like yeah. the people. <laughs> but I mean, there's other levels of fantasy that I guess could elicit guilt feelings. Like if you've ever like really thought so poorly, I, I guess, like where you thought of harming somebody and how that can make you feel guilty later. So I guess in a weird way that we just kind of have that context somewhere that thinking of doing something sexual to somebody without it being okay with them does have that sense and presence of guilt. So I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing to feel a sense of guilt but it goes back into can we question our feelings instead of just reacting to it question the guilt instead of just saying well that's just always bad um i don't personally think it is a bad thing to have a fantasy about somebody else i but then again it also crosses a line of and that's more of an adult problem i think than kids but you know we have that of it's cheating if you think of somebody else while you're being sexually with your partner like there's that too. So I think we just yeah. have a cultural discomfort around thinking about somebody else when it wouldn't be actually okay to necessarily do those things in real life. And, and you know, to be fair, it's still, I, I would still think it is a good thing though that, you know, she did hesitate because when it came to Devon, because that does deal with consent as well. Even though I think she's being hard on herself, I think she could have had that fantasy and not told him, and the world still would have revolved just fine. Uh, on on the flip side, I'm not going to knock anybody that you know would think about that cons that that consent deal because you know. It, it, in an abstract way, she's kind of right that, you know, if, if, you know, they don't have an agreement to where they can be in, you know, intimate with each other, should she, you know? Right. And even psychologically speaking, like the more you fantasize about something, the more you're normalizing whatever those feelings are in your yeah. mind. And so yeah. exactly that even goes into the, you know, fantasy of harm as well so the more you fantasize about hurting somebody the more you might make your brain okay with hurting that person so it, it goes back to i'm kind of okay with that instinct in a sense but not teaching that it's bad teaching that it's something to question is more of of the thought there because okay maybe it's not really going to harm anybody at the end of the day if i think about you know somebody while I pleasure myself just for me to get my rocks off in my head. But you just should maybe question if it's maybe making you feel like you could like touch this person now or something like that. Like if you start obsessing over a human, maybe question the obsession level of it and be like, mm, maybe I need to move to something else in my spank bank for a minute because now I'm obsessing about this person. So mm -hmm. it it's interesting how much that can easily see as being a, a fuzzy gray line of when you cross that, when is it innocent, 
innocently thinking about somebody? And when are you starting to obsess about somebody? And when you obsess about somebody sexually or not sexually, that can kind of turn into a really bad thing um, from as innocent of it can destroy your relationship to as harmful as it could cause you to justify doing something that you really ultimately should have known wasn't okay. Because at that point, you're not really thinking about that other person. You're thinking about the created version of the person that you have in your own mind. And, you know, that is not healthy. Yeah. That, that, you know, is going to cause a relationship to break apart because the real life person is not going to be able to fit up to this fantasy that you are creating. So exactly. And it's something we still encourage in our freaking adult media as well, because mm. how many movies are the preface of somebody really, really, really likes somebody you're following how they really, really, really like this person. And at some point they do it right. They do the kiss. And I can't wait until our consent culture cracks open this topic, because that's something that I wish we'd get rid of, is that passionate buildup, because really you're watching somebody go from being innocently attracted to they build up an obsession to where it gives them permission to not ask for consent before touching somebody's body. And we still normalized and even made it towards something we crave in an essence, the obsessive passionate kiss where we have watched somebody obsess and then they kiss them on the face. And thankfully the person wanted them to obsess and kiss them on the face. So that made it okay. And it's, it's that kind of thing. So it just goes back to questioning once you start obsessing over somebody. Indeed. Now let's talk about the final score here. Out of, uh, I, I saw, it, I believe in your notes, you did a one to 10 too, right? Yeah. I just, I, since you had done yours first, it was nice because it gave me a format. Um, you know, as mentioned earlier, I started a new job. So having the notes to go off was <laughs> super helpful for this week, but yeah. Um, so out of 10, I gave it a six out of 10. Uh, I couldn't peg it as being a really great episode, but I'll give it a six because it wasn't bad as far as a where we left off. You know, sometimes it just feels like you completely forget. Uh, you know, they'll they'll go in uh, other shows, and I wish I had like an example. But you know, sometimes you'll feel like a season, like wow, where where did the last season leave off? <laughs> um, but this really seemed to kind of naturally, you know, we're going on of the continuation of Jay and Lola's breakup, you know, and and moving forward with some of the story with Missy and and things like that. So I thought it was good. It just wasn't great. What about you? Uh, yeah, I'm in the same boat. Um, I gave it a six out of 10 as well. Um, for me, the Missy and Andrew storyline is really the negatives on the episode and really what took it down for me, but not by much. I mean, you know, you're, it's, it, you're still going to get some enjoyment out of it. Even if, even if it's, you know, just like one storyline, like I said, stick around for uh, the Jay and Lola storyline. Cause you know, that was really well done. And there are some, you know, great lines throughout the episode, but yeah, not the best way to start things off, but, you know, they could have done a whole lot worse. Right. It, it didn't completely give me like, oh, my God, this season's going to be so great. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't really recall so far that Big Mouth has done that to me, though. It, it's definitely one of those shows that it seems like each season has plot and character introduction that's that same thing that we've talked about with American television versus others sometimes is we really do have character development. So with each season, you're going to have a little bit of character development that feels like it's happening. And I feel like, and we'll get into this in a later episode, you've already kind of thrown it. We're going to introduce something called the love bugs, right? Yep. So some of this is going to be building up to the introduction of a new character, which is where I feel like some of their season openers have that same sense of, like, okay, I'm having to get to know some people to get into the show. And because every season they introduce new characters, I think we're going to have that every time. Um, yeah. I almost want to go back and watch like just this, the episode one of each season just to see if that's held true. So that was something that was just a personal note of why I think I've felt this kind of trend with them of their first episode is never a, oh my God, I'm going to be everything about this. It, it always has that kind of lingering. I'm learning another character again, even though they haven't introduced them yet. 
yeah it's very much a chapter in a story it's not it's not doing like 24 for instance where the first episode had to be something big and expansive to kind of pull you into it you know so and, that, and that's what i like about it too the fact that it does in a lot of ways play like a novel you know for television they're not playing it like they would you know a, tra- a, a traditional uh like animated show that you'd find on like nbc or something like that exactly um it has an introduction every season. So your first episodes aren't going to be action packed because they are introductory chapters. So you'll get to a point where you'll start to get into themes. And and of course, you're probably going to notice that too, is some of this as you continue forward with the season that you'll have swells. I do recall at one point there was an episode that was particularly painful, but um, it it does pick up. I I like kind of where they go with a lot of this and rewatching it. That's something that I do enjoy that you and I kind of tackle this differently every season so far is I'm a binger and then I'll go back and watch it with intention as I prep notes. So it's really cool to get to go back and watch the beginning episode, knowing kind of where they're going overall with the season and being able to put together. It's like, yeah, gotcha. The first few episodes are slow burns and then you get excited and then it's going to kind of wrap up something, but still tease you something for the next season too. Indeed, indeed. And we are going to bring you, like we said, through each and every episode of season five. So I think we've had one hell of a recording. Oh, yeah, I think so, too. It's good stuff. I, I like the show. Um, and it goes back to its ways that you can relate to a show personally, but still have those themes that you can nerd out about. So it's been fun to talk about. I know we've talked about maybe doing other shows. But this one's been one of my favorites to do this with. And I think it's actually going to be hard to find shows <laughs> to necessarily match this format. So you may as well enjoy it while it's going because yes. we never know when it's going to stop. I don't know what their current contract is through. But hey, we have season five. So we're here in today and now. <laughs> well, remember, remember um, the like the love bugs, they're introduced at Human Resources. Human Resources is going to be the spinoff show. So, you know, they got That's right. There is a spinoff. So yeah. we, we might have another show to be able to do this with, I guess. Then That's right. I forgot. There's a lot of shows announcing spinoffs. So it's muddled. Um, even Letterkenny is like going to have a spinoff, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's part of the beauty of streaming the fact that you know these companies can explore you know a lot of different is stories that they wouldn't necessarily have before but the drawback too is that one of the big problems with streaming is that you're not necessarily going to have tv shows now that are going to last 5 10 20 years now you know most of these you're going to have maybe two or three seasons at best if you're lucky more but you know most like Netflix shows get like one or two seasons, then then that's it on average. Uh, you say if you're lucky, but I don't know if this is necessarily a bad thing. I think there's more oh. shows that last longer than they should than oh. shows that can successfully have a decade worth of content of relevancy. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's something that I've honestly found refreshing about BBC Entertainment is they don't do that. Like they do a few series, they call them a series. Um, And so, yeah, they'll do like a a few of those. And then it's not very common that they have um, season upon season or series upon series upon series, except for Great British Baking Show. And that's because it's a reality show. So of course that has its own value. And that one also naturally, you know, has an ability to evolve. And I mean, just as a weird, crazy throw out, like, look at how it well it adapted to COVID. So, and it just kind of has that ability, but most of the written content like this, like as far as made up shows with storyline content and characters that are created, they seem to have an awareness of how easy it is to jump the shark um, and they don't find a way to milk it. So I've honestly found that more refreshing that we're, we're seeming to move towards that. Yeah, and and I know there's somebody out there that's probably saying, what about Doctor Who? But the entire premise of of an alien that can regenerate into a new person kind of builds on the fact that each doctor can be a new show. I mean, and, and they've expressly said it with like different doctors, like like when they're low on budget, more than likely you'll have a, a new doctor that will only be on Earth, you know, for a while, like the third doctor, the ninth doctor, or if it's popular, then it'll be out in space or whatever. It, it's a new show when there's a new doctor. 
Exactly. So again, it's just a formula that naturally leads to evolution of the show because it gives so much opportunity to change it entirely because each manifestation of the doctor for any non Whovians out there, um, it's different. There is a different personality brought up in each, so to speak, reincarnation of the doctor. But I love that they don't do it with too many shows. So that's something that I'm welcome to embracing in, in our, you know, culture of media here of not every show needs to have 20 seasons. Yeah, um, It's cool to follow people for a decade. It was something I loved about the 70s show that they actually stuck with was they had a concise, it stopped. Granted, then there was the 80s show, but you and, know what? That 90s show. And that 90s show. I haven't watched them. Well, that 90s show is coming to Netflix next year. Oh, um, gotcha. I didn't yeah. watch the 80s show, I guess. Like, I knew there was a continuation. I didn't watch it. It really um, wasn't a continuation. It was a spinoff, but it wasn't like a direct continuation of the, that. Set. It was totally new. Yeah, because it was different characters. Like, they didn't yeah. follow. I don't think anybody stayed. I think they took that as an opportunity. Like, I'm not sure if Kitty or Red, like, that's really how little I followed it. I just really respected that they did the decade. They stopped it. And then they were done, like yeah. up to New Year. I, I thought that was great because it gave a throw to they started it on New Year's. They ended it. So um, I'm not sure how many seasons worth of material this is going to have left. I hope they don't jump the shark. There was an episode later where I felt like it started to. But so far, it's redeemed. Um, but I guess we'll mouth. see what they choose to do. Yeah, for Big Mouth. Yeah. But hey, but you know what? The spinoff could be totally successful on its own where this one could wrap up. So I'm hoping that's what they're doing is that they're getting ready to close some of these arcs but at what point do you close puberty they've kind of also written it where it could stand to last but because and i think you and i have both complained about this they are touching on topics that seem to be a little older for the kids where they actually are at right now so i'm not sure they're going to have that up until 18 of content i think they're going to kind of blow through a lot of it just like how they've kind of covered you know some of the parents puberty too with you know the uh what was it the the banshee the prior season the menopause banshee oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you know so it's not necessarily that you know they could honestly spin off and they have uh, later in the season they cover stuff through leah so we'll see i'm, I'm kind of down with them preparing for a spinoff that i'm hoping is a handoff and i hope it's a successful handoff yeah, and I, I hope, too, that they do have s enough foresight to be able to, like, have a rough plan as to where the show is going. It, it seems to make the most sense since they, they are in high school to just at least plan it to where by the time they graduate high school, that's when the show ends. That, you know, would make the most sense. But, you know, who knows? I mean... I, again, being on Netflix, I don't anticipate. I mean, it's great. They're one of the rare shows that have gotten, you know, more than just a couple of seasons here. So it's great that they're able to continue on. But, you know, they, they shouldn't be like uh, one of my favorite shows from the 2000s, 24, that got old real quick because it was on network television and had to be back each and every year and where it just got more implausible, you know, each year to where it became a parody. <laughs> exactly. So. Let's wrap it up here then. We thank you all for listening. Every Wednesday and Saturday, we'll have something in this podcast space to entertain your ear holes. Until we speak again, we bid you adieu. Farewell, folks. Subscribe to Friends Talking Nerdy on iTunes, the Google Play Music Store, as well as Spotify. Remember to support Friends Talking Nerdy on Patreon. Goodbye, darling. <laughs>